Hello, David McMillan here, and I'm presenting the second interview with Peter Tritton. If you haven't heard of Peter, you can see him in, well, I'll call it an interview, but it was mainly me blabbing over the top of him, but I've uh, learned that lesson and worked out how to shut up. And they said, look, we know this is something to do with you. She's just been threatened with her life. We don't know how you've done it, but we want you to call it off now because they're not. <laughs> We will destroy you, basically. The whole plan came unstuck. It's kind of complicated, and you should read his book, El Infierno, you know, Into Hell, uh, which he describes the whole miserable thing and a very tough time in the Ecuadorian prisons. You might have seen he and I talking about some uh, kind of video postcards he was sent from Ecuador with the intermath of the riots over there, slaughters, heads being held up, cut off, hearts being cut out. I had to really show that, but he knows his stuff. Peter served nine years in South America before being transferred back to the UK. I met him actually in Wandsworth when Thailand was trying to, trying to take me back there to, well, to die, I guess. And that didn't work. I got out, and Peter got out because he'd just done enough. Of course, are we ever really out? There's always the ghost. You can shake hands with an old acquaintance on the street corner and find it exhibit A. You have to be damn careful. Anyway, enough of me. Let's see if I can bring out some good stuff. Here's Peter. Hello, everyone. David McMillan here, and as you can probably guess by looking at the other half of the screen, I am lucky to have Peter Tritton here. And uh, David, um, hello. How's life treating you? Not too badly. It's getting better. <laughs> mm, well, uh, the kind of crazy summer, isn't it? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, I thought. Look, um, uh, many of the viewers will have uh, known quite a bit uh, about uh, nine years in Ecuador and, you know, what, three, was it three prisons that you went yeah. through there and, uh, you know, the ordeal. And if they've got any sense, they would have read your El Infierno, uh, Hell, um, the book that's uh, done very well. Congratulations on that. And so what I thought, well, there's situations that come up. Um, and, well, they happened to me, and I'm sure they happened to you. But before I kind of get to those individual cases, looking at your story, you seem to have had the agencies and the NCA really on your case. I mean, they were threatening to put you back in prison when you came back. Why was that? Well, I have a grudge. <laughs> That's a good question. I don't know. Uh when I was first arrested in in Britain before the uh, the, the second case in Ecuador, uh, a police officer was threatened with her life. I was actually living next door to her uh, near my home. I was living in a house near to my hometown of Stroud in a small village. Right. But um, she was the next door neighbour. She at the time she was a a. Um, like a trainee police officer. Okay. And uh, I used to play tennis with her because there was a tennis court there and whatnot. And, you know, I was quite friendly with her and whatnot. Yeah. And, uh, when the the bust happened, uh, a friend of mine who is now dead um, thought that she had instigated the, the raid. Ah. And, uh, I mean, it was quite a serious affair. I mean, I was... But when, sorry, same. when you say the bust, do you mean the bust in... Uh, Ecuador or no, the... no, no, this one in Stroud uh, that happened in 2000. <clears throat> oh, okay. So I was arrested in, in England. Mm -hmm. And um, so this friend of mine thought that she'd in some way been responsible for my arrest. And so he had suspicions about uh, someone who they thought was an informant in my local town. Yeah. So they hatched a plot to see if they could out this informant. And the way they did it was they sat in a bar where he was drinking, where the informant was drinking. 
and had a loud conversation about the fact I'd just been arrested and how they suspected the police officer or trainee police officer of being responsible and that they were going to either kill her or throw acid in her face. Right. Wow. And at this, I'm, I'm still in police custody. I was held for six days for questioning before being remanded into Gloucester prison. So I'm still in the police station. This is the third day this happened. Was that I, legal? I, was, I thought they could only keep you for... Uh, no, they kept renewing the, t- the, t- the, yeah. the custody uh, limits uh, or whatever. So mm. on, the, on the third day, I got taken out to the Cheltenham Magistrates Court to view the custody time limits again. Right. And when I came out of the court, my friend had obviously just done this. And there was the A category van there, you know, with the cage in the back. Oh, God. Yeah. Really being really funny with me. I didn't know what had happened. There was a helicopter overhead, outriders. They dragged me into the back of this cage. They weren't talking to me. They got me back to the police station, threw me in the cell. My solicitor was there. And I was being held in communicado at this point. So I'd had no phone calls. I'd had no visit. So, you know, I, obviously I'd had no way of communicating with anyone. So. I guess My that's solicitor. the way they wanted it that way if they started to believe yeah. this kind of crap. And I'd, I'd obviously gone no comment all the way through the interviews anyway. Yeah. So my solicitor came in and he said, look, you're going to have to give comment on this because if you don't, they're going to completely fuck you up, basically. Mm. They, they will write you off. So you need to come up with some excuse or reasoning. Mm. And I, so I said, OK, well, I don't know what's going on. There's nothing to do with me. So I went into the interview room and they said, look, we know this is something to do with you. She's just been threatened with her life. We don't know how you've done it, but we want you to call it off now because they're not. <laughs> we will destroy you, basically. So I said, well, I, I said, look, guys, I've had no phone calls, no visits. You've held me incommunicado. How is this? How have I instigated this? Because they suspected I was working with the Adams family in London. You know, mm-hmm. they had me pegged out as some master criminal I, I was at i was like 23 years old at the time long hair hippie type raver ah i've got a different picture now yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so they they, they hate you a, on sight anyway on, the, on this third day if you look online i was photographed coming out of the sweat box you know the the, the, the transport and there's a picture of me covering my face with long hair down the front like this as i'm being brought out of the van that some local photographer took. Ah, well, well. it's you're good coming... to have a record of your life, I suppose. Yeah. And... <laughs> uh, so, anyway. So, when did you find out, um, uh, you know, apart from what the police told you, when did you uh, realise that, in fact, there was somebody you who know who, who'd uh, been putting out... But how did she get the threat? Was it like a phone call or a message in a bottle? Uh, well, no, because the, obviously the informant was an informant. Mm. So, oh, yeah, right. So that they... They just basically the informant did his job mm. unbeknownst to him that it was a setup. So I only discovered uh, that my friend had done this when he came to visit me. Right. So he's, his name was Toby. He's dead now. Uh, he died a couple of years later in suspicious circumstances. Oh. No trace drugs in his system. He was a big bodybuilder, really fit. Died at the age of like 32. Uh, what was, was the uh, official cause of death? They, they didn't come up with one. I think it was unknown. So unknown. Uh, yeah. He was just found dead in his flat uh, on his sofa. <clears throat> well, I suppose if we look at the statistics of people who have made threats uh, against the police of a fatal kind, uh, fatalities often this is follow what them. At the time, the, you know, it was maybe maybe payback i don't know but then so so he's come in on a visit and told me what he did and i said well thanks toby you've just made my life hell because I, from that point onwards i was held as a potential category a prisoner right and it was a nightmare for me in gloucester prison and, I, and that stays with you throughout your prison life in a way you know really much, that's it. why i ended up getting transferred to parkhurst from gloucester prison when i should have been going down to a c category i went up upstream to a wow. basically an ACAP prison. Um, yeah. The, and, but where were you released from eventually? Uh, I was then transferred from Parkhurst to Earlstoke, which is a C category in Wiltshire. Um, it's a shithole from what I hear. 
It, it used to be pretty good, actually. It okay. was. I mean, I was only there. They literally transferred me there for the last three months, two or three months, because they had to to release me. <laughs> yeah, yes, they, because they can't let people out of ACATs and things. Yeah, they they push them to some. Uh, uh, I, I've got. You know, they didn't want people. to me, trust me. <laughs> no. <laughs> so now this was years ago, and yet, even on. Um, the case in South America, you've got policemen uh, saying you're going to be uh, arrested when you come back, uh, stirring up yeah, things about I mean, old and new stuff. And yeah, well, I mean, yeah, like you say, you know, throughout the whole of my sentence in Ecuador, the whole of my time there, I thought I was going to get resentenced when I got back to Britain. And I mean, that the, the pressure and the strain of that mentally was just unbelievable. You know, every day thinking, God, I, you know, I've done nearly 10 years in Ecuador, nearly a decade there. Yeah. When I get back to Britain, I'm possibly going to get another 25 years. And as you said, you, you, you were actually hoping that your sentence was not too short in yeah. uh, Ecuador. So you would get back yeah. too quickly. Yeah, because uh, they'd said that anything less than, te- uh, what was it, anything less than a 10 year sentence. I would be resentenced, or if I served less than six years in prison. I, I suppose what they'd do is uh, <clears throat> take the the material, as it were, of that case, and then claim that uh, this this stuff was destined for the UK, and and say oh, well, well, they, they knew. I mean, they they t- they took out a number of laboratories in Britain. Uh, you know, it wasn't. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's true. But I mean, that particular lot from Ecuador, wouldn't they, they'd have to make a case there that that was, you know, uh, bound for. Uh, and, unless they made an overarching, you know, wide conspiracy well, that's what they case. Did. That's what they did. I mean, they 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 said that uh, you know they they worked out the well as as many as they could find. They they said that we had. Uh, based on the amount that they suspected was in the tent in Ecuador when I was arrested, they threw a, a figure of, of about 85 kilos over a period of, I don't know, a uh, year and mm. a half. And that would have been a pretty ugly thing to face anyway. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> now, I don't know whether this cheers up the tone of it, but I did want to ask, uh, <clears throat> I've had the situation where I've been in source countries, other places, and doing my own thing, and, and you were pretty much an independent. Um, and people there say, uh, Peter, I I want to be your partner. Ah, you be a good guy. I'll give you a kilo, you put it in there with your stuff, and then we're partners. We go 50 <laughs> 50. That kind of. Did that ever come up to you? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that's always, the, I mean, you know, a lot of these. Uh, um, South, well, a lot of the cartels and well, anyone working in South America, they always they're always looking for new avenues out or new markets to open up uh, and new ways of getting the drugs from A to B to you know to the sale point. So you know if if they see that you're doing it su- successfully, they want a piece of it, basically, don't they? They yeah. want the action. You know, they, I suppose. The but way how they, did they think the partnership was going to work? You do all the work, and they take half the money. I mean, in my case, it wasn't. So, so. I mean, we had we we did have our guy in in Cali in Colombia, and we we just did we kind of paid him a fixed salary up for each uh, tent that he put together for us. Yeah. Okay. And that, so that was uh, that worked okay. Did you uh, give uh, a kind of a? I, I found that a, a bonus system worked well. If everything worked out and and they didn't know how it was going, where it was going, what, uh, then I'd be able to come back and say, "Yep, that went okay. Here's another yeah, he five thousand. I mean, that yeah. was that was one of the key things that, that you know we were always very. Uh, it was always an important thing that everybody was looked after and looked after well, and and they were all happy and content. You know, it did us. mean. I mean, it does mean that the. Um, you could say the stock price and the operational costs are, are therefore higher. Uh, I would, it, it, for me, it was about f- instead of paying, I don't know, um, five thousand for something, it, I worked it out there was twenty thousand for something. Uh, this, how would you say that um, uh, pushed up? You know, keeping everybody happy back there. Yeah, did that double I mean, the cost of everything. 
Yeah, I mean, undoubtedly. I mean, you, you know, you mentioned the figure of 20,000. I mean, I think we were paying up between 20 and $30,000 per tent that he did, plus, uh, the, you know, costs and stuff. So it was probably costing. Mm. Uh, it's about f- I mean, yeah, as with, with the with the transport, you know, the the passenger as well, which he used to pay at least ten thousand well, uh, yeah, pounds. Well, yeah, that so that uh, fifty or sixty thousand dollars per tent, I guess. Okay, so really, um, people imagine that uh, <clears throat> that they certainly do, and that you know, people have got nothing to do with it. That uh, oh, I've heard the cost over there is uh, three thousand dollars a kilo. So, uh, oh, you know. <laughs> it is somewhere, <laughs> but uh, it's uh, there's not really the relevant figure to work off, is it? No, no. I mean, you know, but I, I mean, I can quote you a figure of, of, you know, roughly what it might cost today and to buy a kilo of cocaine over there. The, well, uh, uh, I don't know what um, th- there's a. Okay, you've got that figure. Let me give you the range that comes to my mind. I, I know right on the um, uh, the cocoa leaf and running around with a whole lot of um, petroleum jumping up and down it. If it comes out of the first crush there, it can be as little. As, well, I heard around um, twelve hundred US dollars that's, at that point. That's even less. Eight hundred. Really. US. Okay, but what's the city price? That's quite a different thing, isn't city it? City price in, in I know in Ecuador anyway in in the south is about two thousand dollars to two two something like that. Anywhere from eighteen hundred to two two. You know, when you look at that economics of it, it's just another business for them, isn't it? Yeah, totally. I mean, you know, and then you have to look at all the money it brings into the into the port and stuff like that because you know for them to get it into a container. They're paying the people more than the cost of the cocaine. Normally, it's normally two or three thousand dollars per kilo to get it loaded, or to get it packaged, or to you know to whatever to get the out. To, right. know, to pay the people. Or it's generally two or three thousand dollars a kilo. I suppose um, I had people addition- offering me. Oh uh, yeah, in addition to the base price, yeah. yeah. I had people offering me things I was certain was going to be a scam for example they'd say we've got uh, the guy at the airport cleared we've got this we've got that uh we can even get it all, all packed up and ready for you you just hand over the money and you know and it all will be well of course it never would be but yeah. um were those sort of suggestions put to you often uh not when i was not when we were doing our thing no because we weren't paying we I was I was adamant that we would never pay any police officers because as soon as you start as soon as you start paying them, they're either going to want more, or there's going to come a day when it all goes wrong and they will talk. Oops, hold on, I've just lost David. Wait there. Yeah, uh, no, I can still see you, still hear you. Oh, indeed. Um, so I was adamant that we would never go down that route of paying police officers, but I mean that proposal has been put to me. I mean hundreds of times. By various people over the years, oh, mm. you know, pay the airport. We can pay the people at the airport. We can get the passengers through. It, don't you find it is a delicate balance between <clears throat> keeping everybody over there happy, uh, and they, they feel that they're being rewarded, but also kind of generally happy because when you're refusing things, um, they can get more and more upset. So. Uh, did did you have the uh, families of them wanting somehow that you could magically arrange visas for their half wit cousins and things like that? What when we when I was doing my thing in when you're over there, they wanted people to come to the UK and I was uh, in prison when I was working. Oh no, no, just when you were working. Mm. Um, no, not really. No, I mean. The the guy that we were working with, his I think his niece or something was actually married to my Colombian partner, the oh, guy okay. who ended up yeah. ratting me out in the end. Mm-hmm. Um, they were they, yeah, so it was all. I mean, they were all sort mm. of already here. Well, that does raise another question. <clears throat> you said he was Colombian. He ratted you out. 
Yeah. Uh, was that a post arrest thing? Because uh, I've always liked to think yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was arrested oh, in, in right, labs, right. and then and then they they put a lot of pressure on him and his family, and he rolled. <clears throat> um, because you you like to think that they um, they're a bit more stalwart like that, but yeah. uh, uh, oddly enough, uh, I don't know what your world experience is, but I found in the UK we are much less likely to inform on each other just generally than almost anywhere else as far as i can tell yeah i mean certainly from what i've seen of of uh i mean i won't say any particular nationalities yeah. because it might cause trouble but yeah cer certain nationalities that i've witnessed but well i'd be very nervous in america put yeah, it that, that way. sorry i've got a message just came through is that is that tone no it doesn't show up on the screen yeah, just so What's it? Oh, wait a minute. Meet me at three o'clock. <laughs> Make sure it's loaded. What's that mean, Peter? No, no I don't see a That's thing. Go, going back to what I was saying, certain nationalities definitely, uh, I mean, when I was in prison in England, certain nationalities, one member of the family would come in and then a couple of weeks later, the rest of the family would come in and they'd all be in the same cells together. And yet I would later find out that what the first one that had come in had, had, had spilled the beans on all of them and and it would be a domino effect they would then spill the beans on all the rest of them and it was just normal to them it was like it was you know is it it was acceptable to them it's I, strange. I, I, I have heard that before is it a, a deal making it, business plea bargaining and all of that i mean you look at america i mean that's it seems to be that's how they do everything over there isn't it? very right. notorious for it I, and I don't know about you. I can't tell the real from the fake. There, I mean, a wrong one you can pick in your own countrymen pretty quickly. But they're all actors there, aren't they? All yeah. Hollywood. <laughs> okay. Ah, uh, oh yes. I was going to ask too. Now, we've all had these moments. Uh, moments when things were going well on an operation or in life generally, or even if you're retired. Yeah. And there was a moment when something told you everything had turned to shit oh, yeah. um any come to mind uh, i hope there's not too many <laughs> yeah there's several <laughs> um, um just trying to think of a i mean they, look they sometimes you get a call from somebody or, or i even opened a letter and and it seemed it had been tampered with you know that kind of thing where you see the traces of the investigators around um picked up a yeah. tail that kind of thing? um i'm just trying to think i mean you know i mean the the the, the ecuador case um i mean after that first bust when the colombian went into the you know was arrested mm. after that i you know we quickly started seeing we were under surveillance and you know i knew things were on top so it became a, a game very much a game of cat and mouse I mean, oh, we, um, was, weren't you, you weren't tempted to uh, hang up the spurs or try a different. Well, the, the thing was, it could, because it was coming through and it, and we kept getting them in and, that, you know, right under the noses of them, you know, because of the way it was impregnated in plastic, mm. you know, I just kept, decided to keep going. And then it got to a certain point when they raided the, the laboratory in Edinburgh. And at that point, I knew I was, got, I, I, I knew it was fucked, basically. I was, I was gonna, anyway. Mm. So I, you know, I got smuggled out of Britain, and what was the plan there? I mean, that sounds like you'd have to live and work offshore and hope everybody takes care of the ship back here. Well, that's, that's exactly what was we started doing. I mean, I, I I went to France and started operating, you know, using pay phones and all that carry on, uh, and I had you know a trusted lieutenant on the ground here in England who was who was doing things and it was working all right yeah. mm. uh, did you later find out that any of your communications had been intercepted in any way i don't know because i never got to see the the oh i know one of them certainly did nice. because they tried to hit me up with uh links to terrorism <laughs> the uh, yeah so <laughs> i i i uh on this one particular occasion i'd um got a message from this lieutenant, this, this, this friend of mine, saying, um, 
that he was going up to London. Uh, I can't remember what was it, what was going on exactly, but he was going to collect a bag. Mm. Oh, I think he was maybe he was. I can't remember exactly anyway, but he was having to go through London carrying a bag of no goodness, you know, mm-hmm. coke or something for me. And he started seeing uh, undercover police officers all over the place. And something just told me a gut feeling that something was going on. So I, in a, in a, apparently in a text message that they intercepted, I've said to him, be very careful today because there's something going on in London. Mm. That was the day of the second attempted bombing in London where the bombs didn't go off. All right. So and a message saying, be, be careful, there's something going on in London. Life, something was going on. But they, because of what had happened around me in my first case and and also some Pakistani friends of mine who were involved with Al-Qaeda, unbeknownst to me. Oh, right. Uh, mm. Yeah, yeah, I assume like, so. This all came out <laughs> later, later on. Mm. That apparently, I actually ended up having, uh, including that that instance, three other direct links to Pakistanis who were involved with Al-Qaeda that I uh. didn't know about. There was a guy in Gloucester who was involved with Richard Reed, the shoe bomber. Oh, that idiot. They tried to yeah. struck a match. The guys sent him were from Gloucester, who, one of whom I knew indirectly. Uh-huh. Uh, that's kind of unlucky. I mean, so you, I mean, you can imagine from the police's point of view, one instance, one connection, yeah, maybe that's chat. Four, <laughs> it's no, looking at tenuous, you know. I'm starting to have my own doubts here, Peter. Really. <laughs> I mean, yeah. no, it's not that long yet. <laughs> <laughs> that, um, there, it, I, I think um, you know, with the Pakistanis, if you go r- across the borders, you know, into Afghanistan, that's more likely to happen. But you definitely don't want your file sitting on the uh, people investigating terrorism. It just well, uh, MI five were involved in my case in 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 England because I, I don't know exactly why, but it was something to do with the uh, obviously we've got the eavesdropping GCHQ in in Cheltenham, right. and apparently. You were involved with the um, the tapping of phones because before I before I was smuggled out of Britain and went to France, I was mm. using a lot of phones. We wouldn't use mobiles. We were very careful about all this sort of stuff. So what year was having, that roughly? About what time was that? Uh, two thousand and three to two thousand and five. Okay, so there were um, disposable um, mobiles around. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, we, we, you know, I knew how dangerous they were, so we, we were very, we, you know, we would take the badges to Sims out, and we wouldn't have them anywhere near us when we were talking. Mm, mm. You could even um, back-to-back uh, prepaid calling cards there. That is, use one to get connect onto that card system, well, and then once you're in there, use a the second. Make make a phone call from a payphone, get the guy to another payphone, then have a payphone to payphone conversation then that was just to arrange a meeting we wouldn't talk about anything on the phone we would all it was all face to face even even you know having to make the calls to columbia and stuff that you know it was all set up so well in the end that's why on a few occasions i i went out to columbia to set things up so that we didn't need to talk on the phone we would we, we you know we had it running smoothly um <laughs> well that's a rare example of people taking that much trouble i, I can't count the number of times that you know, you set those things up, give that's everybody fine, a new phone. I ended up getting arrested in Ecuador because they, they, they were having difficulty putting a, a case together in England. Mm. Up, in, up until the, the, the laboratory in Scotland when it all got a bit too close to me. So really, they've, they're looking at a period of, from their investigation now, but as much as two years where they think we you've been very active. For a year and a half. Right. And no closer to getting an arrest, so uh, uh, foreign shores would do it. Um, yeah, that was a um, you made the right move by sneaking out. To, when you say you snuck out to France, how did you travel? <laughs> a Turkish friend of mine who was involved with the Turkish mafia took me out in the boot of his Mercedes. <laughs> What's it like traveling in the boot of well, anything? Well, we, we went on the hover, on the hover, hover speed or whatever it was from out of Dover, so it's quite quick. So uh, just drove drove down to Dover as normal, and then just jumped in the boot of the car. Oh, so, right. I was a lot didn't, thinner then. 
<laughs> Didn't I would have felt like asking for a I don't know some piece of string that could pull the catch to get it open to be utterly no, no. reliant on the driver. The back, the back seat will quite often come out on them, won't it? Uh, that's true. And uh, if you uh, started to feel water around your toes after a big <laughs> bump, I guess you'd certainly find out if that back seat yeah. was <laughs> And then when in France, um, um, you had a place to stay, was it hotels yeah. or? No, oh, we, we've got a house out there. Oh, well, that's fine. Um, yeah, I'd, I've never liked, uh, I've always found it creepy in European hotels when it first started out that they actually hang on to your passport for a night. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, I don't like that. Yeah, that's not uh, good at all. <laughs> I mean, uh, you could feel like, oh, well, look, could you take this other passport for the night? I'll, 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 keep, yeah. this. I'll keep the good one. Um, and then, um, so you were able to travel to South America from France eventually. Yeah. So that's that's when I went and did the 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 one last job that I I mean it was it was supposed to be the last job for a while I was just going to do that one the bag was go well the tent was going to England I was coming back from Ecuador to France getting some ch a change of clothes basically and then going on to Thailand to right. stay there for six months and the money would have filtered out to Thailand and yeah. just have a break and let things calm down because yeah he was obviously very much on top at that point but uh, I didn't make it back because they they. They'd been tipped off that, that that was the last opportunity they were going to have to get me for a while. So they took it. And that, uh, what sort of uh, source was that tip off? Was that like somebody close? Oh, from, oh, the same guy. Yeah, he got, he was released from prison in England after six months. Ah, right. So, and then was an active informant. Oh, so he was a uh, um, totally uh, dedicated to the cause of, oh, of yeah. making your life miserable. Yeah, mm. yeah, and yet still within you know the company, as it were. Yeah, I mean, you know, we 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 sussed out that he was definitely wrong, and I remember several instances where he nearly broke down and told me. Mm, close. But, now that that goes to that other question of yeah. um, a, a couple of times I've come across somebody who was, uh, I don't know, I think it was over a passport I had, and. Uh, he was asking the wrong questions, like very detailed things. Like, as you, well, you know, as soon as you, there's certain questions people like start asking, and you know that they've been directed to ask those questions. It's just not in the, in the normal flow of the conversation. As soon as they start, as soon as someone starts asking funny questions that ring a bell in your head, be aware. <laughs> be <careful. laughs> it does. It does. Now, in this case, I think it was that nobody. If you say, "Well, oh, I've got a fake passport." Uh, it wasn't even that he asked what country it was from, but I was reluctant to answer that one. But I gave him, a, threw him off, gave a fake one. I thought, yeah. I didn't think, inform I thought just nosy. But then asked, oh, did you apply for that here? I was in Australia at the time, or, or in New Zealand. Now that's so specific and so beyond the range of what this guy would ask. It was yeah, just exactly. as you say. But here's the thing, <laughs> I decided to, against everybody else's instincts were you know, something diabolical, cement shoes, to use that opportunity to feed back false information. Then. Yeah. Did you consider that? Yeah, yeah, no, we did. That's what I did with the Colombian. Uh, you know, we, we played him as best we could, tried to keep him at arm's length and not, you know, not allow him too much uh, scope or, or too much in, inside information. So, yeah, we, we, we would feed him fake stuff and tell do you think the uh <laughs> the opposition the the police thought this guy's been rumbled a bit because he's being sidelined or, or well, they, 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 they when the when the laboratory and oh what the the, the colombian had been rumbled. yeah did they i mean you know uh, well i mean when when the case came to court in in england i mean i outed him as a, an informant so mm -hmm. My, I had friends at the at Bristol Crown Court in the gallery there. They said they'd never seen anything like this in a case before. When it came to sentencing uh, for the Ecuadorian case, mm. the Colombian got sentenced as well because I think he'd gone outside of his remit as an informant. Yeah. And got, I think he got four years and was quickly released out the back door. <clears throat> but um, they said, 
uh, my friends who were in the gallery said that on the day of the sentencing or or the summary of the case or whatever, the judge has actually read out in court a list of people's names that the Colombian had informed upon and had arrested. And well, that's I, a, I, it's I, useful. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because, I mean, like I say, I'd outed him quite openly as an informant. And what I was trying to do with that was I was trying to destabilize the case, hoping that they would throw mm. the case and not present and not put him in the dock as an informant. I thought he would be too scared to go up as an informant, but he, he went through with it. Um, I suppose it, it's something he wouldn't have done at home. Uh, but I, can but... I can tell you now, in, in the case, there were at least six or seven informants and five are dead in my case well they have unlucky lives after yeah. i can You're imagine <laughs> very easily uh you know when they got back to colombia that uh, well that, that was, one of them turned up dead out there uh with a note pinned on her chest saying uh informant something blah 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 yeah it's not frowned on um i hear the chinese tribes actually pay somebody in the organization to uh um be the official informant and and they, they train him up and give them false things to keep yeah, them busy, it would make but, you know. now uh, you know the the casualties from our point of view um are often uh family and friends in this because the the, the police and other people will the agencies uh, will use that to hang over your head at, yeah um no doubt we got regrets but do you think there's it's possible to be in the business and protect family and friends um yeah but i mean you know if someone wants to get to your family i mean if your family are going about leading their normal lives it's difficult to protect them yeah the only way that you're going to be able to protect your family do you mean your close family or well um yeah, and you know, people that you, you see regularly and you want to see. Of course, you know, you can cut yourself off completely, but... You know. Yeah, I mean, that's it. I mean, it depends to what degree of protection you're, you're talking is necessary. I mean, if you're talking that you've got an imminent threat and that sort of protection, you, you need to take them away and hide them, then it all becomes very complicated. Mm. You know, and that, no. Life and... I mean, it is difficult to protect family and friends because if someone's really out to get you then this is you know well supposedly the, the the police are constrained within certain guidelines i'm but, talking uh, about the police more than yeah oh yes yeah i'm not i mean we're, we're not going to really be in a situation where a fellow businessmen uh, are going to be uh, thinking even dreaming of attacking our family but police tend to say <laughs> oh well you're not being cooperative perhaps your girlfriend will have more to say or yeah, yeah. I mean, it, to, to protect them from the police is difficult. I mean, they, they threatened my father with uh, imprisonment because they, they were trying to say that he was involved in laundering my money, which was an absolute joke. It was just scare tactics, you know, which, yeah, I mean, it had its effect. It did scare him. I mean, he was like 65 at the time or something. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, you don't want to put them through, yeah. even if you know it's nonsense. It, it, yeah. um, they, I mean, I, as far as my girlfriend went, yeah, I mean, they they did arrest them. They did put her in prison. They did use her as a bargaining tool. They didn't get very far because I managed to get her out. I mean, in Ecuador, they then re-arrested her in England and gave she her messed that up though, didn't she? Somehow, I think. Yeah, she shouldn't have come back to England but anyway. That's another uh, uh, story. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I think uh, um, uh, people often are naive, aren't they? That they think. Uh, well, I I didn't tell mum and dad, and yet they carelessly asked them to hold on to some money for them, saying, oh, well, I'm not going to tell you where it's from. That, you know, leaves the door wide open. Um, yeah. Did, uh, you could have, was there ever any threat with your supposed terrorist links that if any money changed hands, very much pe parents well look, this is what this is what they were looking at that this is what they were looking at like finance and terrorism because i mean the pakistan is that, that i mentioned earlier i was dealing with in you know in mm. illicit substance we say mm. and uh you know that that's the angle that the police were going in on was saying you know there's a possible 
case for financing terrorism here because you're buying drugs from them and they are actively involved in terrorism. But I mean, it was, you know, I was in prison in Ecuador by that point. So I don't think they were really that worried. I mean, it was obvious, it was obvious that yeah. I wasn't involved, you know. No, no. I, they, I, they were curious as to how I appeared to know that something, you know, that attempted bombing was going on in London. I mean, it was just pure fluke. I, did, I had no idea that was going on at all. It was just the wording of the message. <laughs> I've often wondered what, uh, what I'd do, uh, and I'll ask you, if you're, you're up to some mischief, We've got a very strictly planned week and you come across something that now if it's just another bit of business fine nothing to do with you but uh how far would you mess yourself up to stop a um a possible or maybe a fake terrorist bombing i i, I, I oh, think so terrorism guy i'd go all out <laughs> Yeah, I no, think it would probably be worth it um, because uh, um, I don't think I'd in... That, I'd get that gnarled tusk out. I'd be the one on the bridge tabbing it. <laughs> 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 that was quite impressive that day, wasn't it? He was chased yeah. by, what, four people or something, wasn't he? Fire extinction, gnarl, was it gnarl? A narval. <laughs> Apparently it's the tooth, actually. Yeah, it's, that. <laughs> uh, ten, nobody knows quite what it's it, for. Right, right. He, he just missed the guy's carotid artery with it, didn't he? Yeah. He, he, uh, he, he nearly <laughs> killed him with that thing. <laughs> that would have made a, a, a special case for that thing. Uh, I don't know whether... <laughs> Where did it come from? It was a display or was something. A, yeah, on display in in the um, fishmongers hall or whatever. Mm. Did um, when you uh, that was a as you know uh, a big meeting about sort of prison reform and and um, getting people to um, reintroduce themselves. Did um, with your transfer back from South America, you were released, but I, there wasn't any. Is there any parole supervision period on that? Um, because I'd done so so much of my sentence in Ecuador, the I mean, you know how the transfer system works when you come back, yeah. when you're repatriated back to Britain. Um, it meant that, because uh, I'd done nine years, three months out of a 12-year sentence. And then I think I had a certain amount of, um, like, uh, uh, I, I, I don't know what, uh, remission. Oh, um, okay. But yeah. not much. And then I, I did another 10 months in, in Wandsworth. So in total, out of the 12 year sentence, I did 10 years and 10 days. Oh, oh that's right. And, uh, and I would have had to have done 11 years out, out in Ecuador. So it left a year. So I did, it was, it was something, they were, they were in shock, actually. Because obviously the, the seriousness of the crime and the and the length of the sentence, mm. if that had been England, I would have had probably ten years of parole after that. Or, or so. But or, you did have but, some kind of a little like bit six, of it then. Six um, I found that um, because of uh, what I'd been up to and because it was complex, the supervising <clears throat> parole officer seemed so distant so unconnected with anything i mean how did you handle that person and what were they like God, i'm just trying to remember actually because i mean obviously it was uh, oh, it's non-entity <laughs> yeah no it, um, uh, it was a woman i remember that back in stroud in my hometown it was such a brief amount of time right um, especially i i think it was six months it flew by. It was gone with before I knew it. Mm. And so, you were in the area anyway, so I don't suppose it was a great burden. No. But uh, <clears throat> do you think those things make any difference in what happens to whether somebody goes back in or reoffends or not? I think they can do. I think, that, I mean, the whole system needs changing in some way, doesn't it? I mean, mm. there's so many people that end up in prison that shouldn't be in prison anyway. Yes, you know, and then there's the whole legalization of drugs question. I mean, where do you begin? I mean, it's just a yeah. Oh, and and uh, at the moment they're just building more prisons, aren't they? 
Uh, you know, opening up more spaces to put more people away. It's becoming like America where they're just warehousing people. Uh, luckily, they're backing away from the privatization thing a bit. That They've had such disasters fun. with it and end of the parole yeah. service. But did you find in UK, uh, it had been years since you'd been in the UK and you'd, you'd been in, done some time before and you came back to Wandsworth, which admittedly is a kind of, oh, well, full of everything from very few serious criminals, but mostly wife beaters and nutcases. But did anything about the composition of it surprise you? How do you mean? Oh, uh, well, compared to the way it was a decade earlier, was it worse, better, stranger? Uh, I, it, uh, I think it definitely got worse. Definitely. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, they, they, they seem to have stripped away a lot of the, the courses such as plumbing, I don't know, building, painting and decorating, you know, courses that actually make a difference or used to make a difference to people's lives or prisoners that went in, they would come out with a trade for life, uh, you know. <laughs> Those things yeah. did work. Um, yeah, in fact, they worked so much better than than just either just locking people in the cells or giving them basic maths and English. I mean, you know, and then they've got, you know, they're they're at the other end of the system, and what are they? What are they coming out with? Nothing. And, got and no, what's no your opinion? Benefit. <laughs> what's your opinion of the? Um... What would I do? The, the course is barely deserving the name of a course. It's sort of a victim impact or um, uh, awareness. They don't teach you to do anything, but they're supposed to make you more so aware of your place in society and what you're supposed to do. I, I, I found people just agree with whatever they got to say with it and sign themselves off in the course. Yeah. Uh, I've never come across anybody who actually took them seriously. No. Um, can't even, they change the name so often, don't they? It, uh, I can't remember, to be honest. No, I know it all goes past. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> even the drug courses used to uh, <laughs> uh, change names a lot. Um, OK, yeah. Uh, now, this is something that's happened to me. I never know the result of it. Uh, but have you been doing something, it might have been a, a routine operation or something new, but whatever the case, and a gut feeling told you to step back from the whole thing. Yeah, there I, I've got a very good example of this. <laughs> right. um, I was, this, this is uh, before I was arrested in England the first time. Mm. And, uh, you know, I'd been going up and down to London of, I mean, almost daily picking up kilos of cocaine bringing them back to the southwest or up to scotland wherever and selling them either as a whole or in pieces and uh the, um somebody had introduced me to this this new guy from shepherd's bush and um so this new guy's phoned me up and he said oh uh i've got uh, a half a key for sale and it was like uh maybe a, a grand or two below what i was paying in uh, mm. from Erith, uh, yeah. yeah, East London direction. So, so I thought, oh, you know, I'll go and have a look at this. So, at the time, I had a, a Renault Megane on on hire, right? And driving down the motorway, I get stuck in traffic. You know, you start running up against barriers to your course. It's not going smoothly. So, oh, right. So you're talking about. Um slightly unexpected events routine ones but thing you're getting a sense that something's trying to stop sense you from you going yeah you shouldn't be going in this direction so i run into traffic uh i think i had a slow puncture in one of the tires that i knew about yeah. so i get down as far as chiswick and um i i pull off the road and i said i pull just off the high road into a lane uh it runs parallel to the high road there and the tire goes down on the car so now i'm stuck there and i uh, yeah i mean cutting a long story short i just had a real bad feeling about the whole situation and sure enough the guy turns up i've told him to come on his own and he turns up with a friend and before i know it there's a two-shot derringer facing <laughs> me it, I, it you know pointed at my chest he, uh, he wanted, <laughs> he wanted to make those shots rather than pulling a gun he's shown me this half key of coke and I've realized that this half key, this, this, this Coke is the same stuff I'm getting from Iris. 
Uh. So obviously it's coming from the same people. Then they've robbed me. So uh. I thought, take it, take the money. You know what I mean, I'm not yeah. getting. Uh, oh, hold on, my battery's running out. I'm not getting shot over fourteen grand. Well, while uh, Peter and I are thinking about what that might mean. We'll hold it here for a while, and I'll be back with part two of this quite entertaining session with Peter Tritton. Oh, 